5 billion new people will connect to the Internet in the next decade. And with this mass adoption, the world's population will, in one generation, have gone from having virtually no access to unfiltered information to accessing all of the world's information through a device that fits in the palm of the hand. What's more extraordinary is that most of these people are coming online in parts of the world ridden with the greatest number of challenges, where autocracy is already the dominant governance model for the physical world, and violence and conflict are all too familiar. So what will adding these five billion new people to the virtual world mean for our future? Will the world be more or less stable? Who will be more powerful in the future, the citizen or the state? Will technology make terrorism easier or harder to carry out? What is the relationship between privacy and security? And how much will we have to give up to be part of the new digital age? Despite the many challenges that await us in the future, there are certain known benefits that we will all experience. At every level of society, connectivity will continue to become more affordable and practical in substantial ways. People will have access to ubiquitous wireless internet networks that are many times cheaper than they are now, will be more efficient, more productive, and more creative. In the developing world, public wireless hotspots and high-speed home networks will reinforce each other, extending the online experience to places where people today don't even have landline phones. Societies will leapfrog an entire generation of technology. Eventually, the accoutrements of technologies we marvel at today will be sold in flea markets as antiques, like rotary phones before them. And as adoption of these tools increases, so too will their speed and computing power. The promise of exponential growth unleashes possibilities in graphics and virtual reality that will make the online experience as real as real life, or perhaps even better. Indeed, the next moments in our technological evolution promise to turn a host of popular science fiction concepts into science facts. Driverless cars, thought-controlled robotic motion, artificial intelligence, AI, and fully integrated augmented reality, which promises a visual overlay of digital information onto our physical environment. Such developments will join with and enhance elements of our natural world. The vast majority of us will increasingly find ourselves living, working, and being governed in two worlds at once. In the virtual world, we will all experience some kind of connectivity, quickly and through a variety of means and devices. In the physical world, we will still have to contend with geography, randomness of birth, some born as rich people in rich countries, the majority as poor people in poor countries, bad luck, and the good and bad sides of human nature. In this book, we aim to demonstrate ways in which the virtual world can make the physical world better, worse, or just different. Sometimes these worlds will constrain each other. Sometimes they will clash. Sometimes they will intensify, accelerate, and exacerbate phenomena in the other world so that a difference in degree will become a difference in kind. What does all this change mean for the 195 nations on Earth? They will have to practice two versions of their domestic and foreign policies, one for the physical, real world, and one for the virtual world that exists online. These policies will appear contradictory at times. Governments might crack down in one realm while allowing certain behavior in another. They may go to war in cyberspace, but maintain the peace in the physical world. But for states, they will represent attempts to deal with the new threats and challenges to their authority that connectivity enables. In a world where everyone is connected, how will people be impacted by a world that is both physical and virtual at every level? For citizens, coming online means coming into possession of multiple identities in the physical and virtual worlds. In many ways, their virtual identities will come to supersede all others as the trails they leave remain engraved online in perpetuity. And because what we post, email, text, and share online shapes the virtual identities of others, new forms of collective responsibility will have to come into effect. 
What roles and responsibilities will companies have in this future world? For organizations, institutions, and companies, opportunities and challenges will come hand-in-hand -hand with global connectivity. A new level of accountability, driven by the people, will force these actors to rethink their existing operations and adapt their plans for the future, changing how they do things as well as how they present their activities to the public. They'll also find new competitors, as widespread technological inclusion levels the playing field for information, and therefore, opportunity. And technology companies will find that they will inherit an entirely new set of challenges and issues, along with billions of new users. Every challenge in the world, even the thorniest and most controversial ones, will become relevant to their business. In the future, no person, from the most powerful to the weakest, will be insulated from what in many cases will be historic changes. What challenges await us? For democratic and autocratic societies alike, the absence of a delete button on the internet will be one of the great intractable challenges of our future. Information wants to be free, as the saying goes. So, as another saying goes, don't write anything down you don't want read back to you in court or printed on the front page of a newspaper. In the future, this adage will broaden to include not just what you say and write, but the websites you visit, who you include in your online network, what you like, and what others who are connected to you do, say, and share. Any would-be professional, particularly those in positions of trust, will have to account for his past if he or she is to get ahead. Kids will live their lives faster online than their physical maturity will allow, which means that parents will have to talk to their kids about online privacy and security years before they talk to them about safe sex. Every citizen will have a virtual entourage and trail of cumulative content. As such, online identity will become such a powerful currency that we will see the explosion of an industry designed to provide a corporate answer to identity management, an avalanche of laws designed to protect identity, and excuse content posted before someone's 18th birthday for later in life. And we may even see the rise of a new black market, where people can buy pre-made, real, or invented identities. Citizens and violent criminals will all find the prospects of black market identities attractive, since the false identity that could provide cover for a known drug smuggler could also shelter a political dissident. The identity will be manufactured or stolen, and it will come complete with backdated entries and IP, Internet Protocol, activity logs, false friends and sales purchases, and other means to make it appear convincing. In democratic countries, corruption, crime, and personal scandals will be more difficult to get away with in an age of comprehensive citizen engagement. In repressive societies, what little privacy existed before will be long gone, because the handsets that citizens have with them at all times will double as the surveillance bugs regimes have long wished they could put in people's homes. Technological workarounds will protect only a distinct technically savvy minority, and only temporarily. Just as bad dictators sitting on natural wealth exchange their resources for weapons to exert control in the physical world, so too will these same dictators make an exchange for virtual weapons of surveillance in the digital version of an arms trade. While there will be less autocracies in the world, those with the means can buy a police state 2.0. With so many tools in the hands of so many people, what will we do to each other? Never before have we been so aware of so many conflicts around the world. The accessibility of information about atrocities anywhere, the stories, the videos, the photos, the tweets, can often make it seem like we live in an exceptionally violent time. But as the newspaper adage goes, if it bleeds, it leads. What has changed today is not how many conflicts there are, but how visible they've become. However, the big change in our future will be the opening of a cyber front to every conflict. We may see the first online ethnic cleansing as states target a specific ethnic minority, filter their online content, intercept their online payments, slow their internet connection, and infect their computers with malware. Terrorists, too, will increasingly look to open a virtual front as traditional violent extremists team up with criminal hackers. Virtual kidnappings, stealing the online identities of wealthy people, anything from their bank details to public social network profiles, 
and ransoming the information for real money will be common. Rather than keep and maintain captives in the jungle, guerrillas in the FARC or similar groups will prefer the reduced risk and responsibility of virtual hostages. Terrorists and criminals will use everyday drones purchased at toy stores to make aerial improvised explosive devices or the new IEDs. Their use of everyday drones for attacks and smuggling could result in a conflict between military and civilian drones on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, or perhaps even the U.S.-Mexico border. For terrorists and cartels alike, the most important question of the future will not be who is their charismatic leader, but rather who is their chief technology officer. We may even see the world's first drone strike against a cyber terrorist. But for all the advantages that it may seem terrorists and criminals gain from technology, the future will be more disruptive to them than we think. It's hard to imagine extremist groups operating out of caves in Tora Bora constituting a cyber threat. But as connectivity spreads throughout the world, even remote places will have reasonable network access and sophisticated mobile handsets. If they are connected, they're leaving some kind of digital footprint, and the room for error becomes far greater. Any mistake made in their personal or professional activities will be captured, time-stamped, and geolocated in a way that could lead to the dismantling of an entire network. But while these challenges are real, the ultimate result of 5 billion new people coming online is positive. As we look into the future, its promises and its challenges, we are facing a brave new world, the most fast-paced and exciting period in human history will experience more change at a quicker rate than any previous generation. And this change, driven in part by the devices in our own hands, will be more personal and participatory than we can even imagine. In the future, computers and humans will increasingly split duties according to what each does well. Information technology will be everywhere, like electricity. It will be a given so fully a part of our lives that we will struggle to describe life before it to our children. When exposure meets opportunity, the possibilities are endless. What is the best thing to do to improve our quality of life when this happens? We cannot eliminate inequality or abuse of power, but through technological inclusion, we can help transfer power into the hands of individual people in ways that will provide unprecedented opportunity to curb autocracy prevent violence, and further human progress. But how do we do it? Find out on April 23rd.